Before we go ahead and open our Bibles, one last thing. Um, uh, Zach Durkin here, you know, has been playing a, like a homeless on Sunday mornings and that. He's part of our youth group. And uh, also he and, uh, and Ryder here also go to the youth group at uh, Bradley as well in the afternoons on Sundays. And so Zachary this afternoon has an opportunity to teach uh, in the youth group. He's going to share a lesson. And it's actually on spiritual warfare, which is what this whole conference was about. It was called Armed and Dangerous. Well, Zach's going to be teaching on the... Uh, uh, spiritual warfare today and that uh, in, in the youth group over there. And so I thought it'd be great to pray for him. Uh, why don't you come on up, buddy? We're going to go ahead and pray and uh, just ask God to bless uh, his, his teaching out there today. It's the first time, and so we're going to pray that he doesn't sweat too much. And <laughs> <laughs> I remember my first message, bring deodorant, my brand brother. So, but let's pray for Zach here this morning. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity you've given our, our young brother here. and just pray that God you would bless uh, his ability to share your word this afternoon. Thank you, Lord, that you've given him this chance and pray that, Lord, uh, you would just speak to him and that you'd speak through him. Pray that, Father, as he opens the word and begins to share the, this, this teaching, especially on spiritual warfare, uh, which, Father, uh, so oftentimes, uh, you know, even as grown-ups, we sometimes don't think about uh, as, as often as we should. And I pray that, Father, here in this uh, time this afternoon that you would give Zach the ability to share on these things and also to encourage the kids to recognize uh, that, Father, just because they're younger, the devil doesn't just start to play fair and give them a chance. And so I pray that he would help them to gird up and be ready for the kinds of battles that await them as teenagers, as young people, as young men and women that are preparing to grow up and step out in the world and live as Christians among a world that's not very friendly to say the least. And so I pray that, Father, you'd have your hand upon him and anoint him with your Holy Spirit for the work that you've given him this afternoon. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, bro. Go get him. All right, any youth groupers still in here, y'all can head on down, and I think Justin's ready for you. All right. Well, praise the Lord. Again, we're going to, um, this morning, open our Bibles and once again find ourselves in, in the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to be in chapter 4. We'll finish the chapter today. We're going to look at verses 31 through 44, Gospel of Luke. Uh, does anybody need a Bible? Uh, no one had a hand up before, but okay. Luke chapter 4, verses 31 through 44. We went a little long on announcements, so I guess I'm going to have to just try to finish up by 12.30 today. I'm kidding. But I could. <laughs> Okay, chapter 4, verses 31 through 44. And then he, Jesus, went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. And now in the synagogues there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Imagine what that might have sounded like. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in their midst, it came out of him and did not hurt him. And then when they were all, or they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What a word this is, for with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. Now he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house, but Simon's wife's mother, his mother-in-law, was sick with a high fever, and they made request of him concerning her. And so he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and served them. And when the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick were with various diseases, brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuked them. He did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. And now when it was day, he departed and went into a desert, uh, deserted place. And the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning and ask that our hearts would be ready to receive what it is that you would say to us through it. We pray that, Father, you'd help us to grow into a deeper knowledge of who you are and a deeper maturity in our relationship with you. We know that you've called us to such a time as this, so equip us as we spend time in your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Authority. Authority. Sometimes that word really kind of bristles us, doesn't it? It kind of rubs us the wrong way because it kind of acts as a kind of 
it, it rubs against our personal sovereignty. You know, we, we like to think that we're in charge. We like to call the shots. We like to be in control of things. We don't like giving orders. If you say the word authority to a parent, it means one thing. If you say it to a child, it means something different. Uh, authority from a parent's standpoint, we understand there's value. We're bringing our child up. From authority from a kid's point is like, <sighs> gotta go to bed, I gotta eat my veggies, gotta brush my teeth, gotta put on deodorant, gotta, I gotta do all this stuff and everything because mom and dad said so. And that just begins to irritate us and rub us the wrong way and we don't like that kind of thing. Uh, it's an affront to us, uh, you know, but the truth of the matter is, if we really think it through, uh, even as a younger person, if we have the chance to think this through, we, we really wouldn't want to live in a world where there wasn't authority because what's the opposite of a world that is based on some kind of authority? It's anarchy. Every, you know, it's, it's, you know, there's a time in the Bible, in the Old Testament, the book of Judges in particular, where uh, the Holy Spirit illuminates us to the mindset of Israel at that period of time. Uh, and it's, this, it's this, uh, this chilling phrase. It says, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Uh, from God's perspective, that was not in any way an endorsement of what they were doing or a compliment in any way. From their perspective, they probably didn't understand the effects of the fact that they weren't living under God's government on a personal level. They were doing their own things. Uh, and, and, of course, the, the cycle of, of that is that they would they'd fall into sin and God would judge them. And then they would God would send a prophet and he'd call them to repentance. They'd repent for a while, but then they'd fall into sin again. And then God would have to judge them. And then he'd send a prophet to call them to repentance. And then they'd repent. Then they'd fall into sin again. This whole process would go on and on and on for, for, for you know, a long, long time. So when it says they were doing what was right in their own eyes, that wasn't speaking of a good kind of freedom. It was actually speaking of the kind of freedom that takes away your freedom. You know, that's the kind of thing that uh, when you take authority out of the picture, that's kind of what's left. And so when authority is wielded unjustly, it can become a terrible weapon to destroy. And of course, we see this all over the world. I mean, anytime you see a, a dictatorship where somebody is running a country with an iron fist and they've got the people that are oppressed and constantly overburdened and overworked and overtaxed and everything, in order to sort of allow the, the upper crust to continue to live in their elitist kind of position while everybody else suffers and struggles. We see this all over the world. This is not just some old time kind of a thing. It was certainly true in their time when Jesus was speaking, but it's even true in our day as well. There's an expression, you know, absolute power what? Corrupts, absolutely, right? And there's, there's truth to that. Uh, and so we see this in the world, but, and, and so we, we can see where a fear of authority might come from. And so there's a reaction to that authority to try and overthrow it in so many oppressive regimes and societies. But you know, authority when wielded unjustly in a home can also be oppressive, it can also be terrible. Uh, when you have parents that uh, just, just lord over their children in such a way where, uh, where, where they just hold them down and never allow them to flourish. You know, there's, there's a passage where Paul in Ephesians 5 talks about families and relationships, and he says to fathers, don't exasperate your children. Now, as a dad, I know I have exasperated my child from time to time because, uh, because I'm a guy, and it's like something goes wrong, something gets broken, something gets hurt. We've got to fix it. You're the problem right now, kid. So it's like there's, there's problems with that kind of a mindset, but it's, 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 it should never be. I'm confessing to you. But when, when parents take this mindset and we bring down upon our kids and this kind of thing, or when a husband, uh, and let's face it, guys, everybody loves the part of Ephesians 5 where Paul talks about wives submit to your husbands, right? And if you enjoy it, it's because you don't really understand it. Uh, but we all love to hear those words and that kind of thing. Why? Because we can be control freaks. We can be the kind of people that like to kind of rule our home and have things just so. The home is the man's castle, right? This kind of thing. That's, uh, that's a whole other sermon. But when you have that kind of a mindset in a home, it can be very, very destructive. It also happens in the churches, though. It's not a strange thing to see a church that has an oppressive leader or leadership where um, there is this separation between parson and person, where there's this uh, ability for the leaders to sort of become aloof and distant from the church itself, the body of believers, and they begin to feel like they are somehow God's... And in some cases, I mean, pastors are called to be a mouthpiece for the Lord, but sometimes pastors feel like they are God's mouthpiece. And what they say, simply by virtue of having said it, is God's word to that church, whether or not God ever actually inspired that thought of that mindset of that word. Uh, the shepherding movement comes out of this kind of thing. As a matter of fact, cults come out of this kind of thing. 
uh, oppressive kinds of leadership that don't allow, in fact, God to work in that context, but in fact hold people down and crush them. Of course, this was true in Jesus' time with the scribes and the Pharisees who you know, would, 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 would tell others to lift burdens on their backs but wouldn't lift a pinky to try and help or anything. Uh, this was a mindset that these folks would have been all too familiar with in that time. Now, that's when, ex- when authority is wielded unjustly, but when it's exercised properly or rightly or justly, then far from being an oppressive, terrible tool for destruction, it becomes a wonderful tool for building and for developing and for cultivating. Uh, You know, it's like a shovel in the ground that just kind of tills that ground up when it's used the right way. It, It promotes growth. It promotes fruit. In a society, we see this is true. Again, we see the converse of of an abuse when we see that when when authorities exercise justly and laws are there that provide for freedoms to be fully enjoyed rather than oppressed, it's a good thing. We may not like the speed limit. Julie reminded me of the speed limit many times on the way home because I seem to drive more by faith than by sight sometimes. But uh, never dangerous to parents. But, uh, but you know, I, my foot's a little heavy on the right side. So, um, but we see speed limits. We don't like that. But the reason they're there is so that we can be safe. We don't like the fact that, um, that there are laws that curtail things that we might in our flesh want to do But the truth is, if we all did whatever we wanted to do, somebody's right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness would be stomped all over. There's a reason why there are laws, and God has established government to provide for peaceful civilization. So there is an authority that God puts in place, even in a societal sense, that's very, very good. You know, it's, true, it's a true statement, and while you know, an immediate context might speak of Israel, the context that Isaiah or some, the Psalms speak of, when, when the psalmist writes, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, that is true for any nation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, a nation who puts itself under God, as you might recall, our own pledge refers to. This is a good thing. In a home, of course, authority is rooted in God's order. And when it's established and worked out in the way God described it, it brings home a home life where marriages can grow and kids can flourish. Where, yes, there's going to be times where there's correction needed and this kind of thing. But in general, life is going to be good and solid. There's a relationship between husband and wife that is based on what God has to say. And therefore, it can become strong, deeply rooted, and it can be fruitful, and it can be beautiful. Children can flourish under that sense where they they know that the restrictions are there not to curtail them, but because those boundaries are there because they're loved and they want to be and they know their parents want to protect them and watch over them is it possible to go overboard sure it is sometimes out of our fear of what could happen we get overboard with things but in gen- but but just in general when we have rules and regulations for kids it's because we understand that if they don't have those parameters they can get hurt it's not okay if we if we let Nina go you know she has a friend down the street that that they they made plans on their phones to get together at nine o'clock out in the field across from the house. Now that's fun. I was a kid. That's great. It's just just to get out when it's dark and go meet a friend and hang out. Okay, fine. She's not going by herself. I'm going with. Or she ain't going. Right? Sorry, kid. But you don't understand how wrong it is to tell your 11-year-old to go out into a field behind a row of houses across the way without a parent in the dark. Now, we live in Franklin, which is a nice town, but that doesn't mean that somebody couldn't do something to a couple of kids in the middle of a field in the dark. And so there's rules there, and that's just how it's going to be. When you're 18 and you move out, you can establish your own rules. You can run with scissors all you want. You can sit three inches in front of the TV. Fine. (laughs) You're not going to in our house. You're going to clean your room. You're going to do stuff while you live here. Why? Because it's good. It's right. It develops something in you. It develops a sense of understanding of boundaries that are good and safe and right. You see, authority is not always bad. When it's exercised justly, it can be a powerful tool to build up and to protect. In the church, leadership that expresses authority is one under authority. In other words, when a pastor acknowledges whose sheep the sheep really are, and he exercises authority while being under authority himself, this produces an environment in which people can grow. No pastor is a shepherd unto himself. He is at best an under-shepherd. The good shepherd is the one who really shepherds the sheep. And when a pastor recognizes this, abuses of authority are at a minimum if they exist at all. Because he understands, much like the soldier before Jesus when he said, look, I'm under authority. You speak to this thing, it'll happen. When I tell my soldiers to jump and they say how high, I understand this concept. Pastors also need to understand this. When the Lord says jump, we're supposed to say how high, just like anybody else. He's the one who's the Lord. 
He puts parameters upon us that we might grow, not that we might die. As, <laughs> as an aside, I'm, the, I'm hoping they'll post it, but at the conference there's this wonderful video uh, about how the rules that are established for the conference are there so the kids won't die. And uh, it was a lot of fun. I, hopefully it'll be there, you guys can see it. But, but rules serve a purpose, a good purpose, when they're exercised and authority is exercised properly. Now, the text that we're looking at this morning, really this whole section here from verse 31 through the end of the chapter, and we'll see it pop up periodically throughout the rest of the gospel, we see that what we're really talking about, what's in view here, is Jesus' authority. Okay, it's not just that he does miracles. It's not just that he preaches. It's not just that he casts out demons. There's a reason behind it. There's, a, there's a, an empowering behind it. There's a, there's, there's a foundation to it that's really coming to the surface, and that is the, the, the foundation of his authority. Okay, and that's what I'd like to look at this morning. Now, the word there for authority, you'll notice here again, as we look at verse 31 where it says, uh, or verse 32, they were astonished at his teaching for his word was with authority. There are two words that, that generally are translated power, and one of those words is also often translated authority, and that's the, the word that's here, and that's the word uh, exousia. It's a Greek word that means authority. It speaks of power, but authority kind of power. The other word is dunamis. We've probably heard that word a lot, dynamite power. That's like anointing of the Holy Spirit kind of power. That's the power that was upon these guys when they came out of the upper room and began to preach because they had been empowered by the Holy Spirit. Dunamis had come upon them, power from on high. Um, two different words that both can mean power, but one is different in its expression of what power really is. Now, uh, as Jesus is here teaching on the Sabbath, and of course you remember his first teaching on the Sabbath was met with mixed reviews. Uh, we talked about that last time. At the end of his preaching last time, they wanted to kill him. Uh, but nevertheless, his preaching ministry continues. Why? Because that is the purpose for which he was sent, as he says at the end of the chapter here. He needs to preach to this group and also to the other cities outside. That is one of the fundamental aspects of his purpose in ministry. Okay? So as he does this, though, he is speaking, and they are astonished at this, he is speaking with authority. Now, what does that mean? In that time, when, when rabbis would teach... It was an extremely common practice for a rabbi to make often, uh, often make references to other rabbis or other great known teachers or past works of antiquity that would sort of give weight to what they were saying. Uh, it's, it's like any, you know, and I've done this too. It's like if, you know, uh, if I mention a, a quote by like a G. Campbell Morgan or something like that, um, you know, I'm, I'm giving credit where credit is due, but, but the fact that a, a great mind said something so profound uh, also lend some you know, additional weight to what I'm talking about here as I'm breaking forth some teaching. Well, there's, there's a way to sort of, instead of utilizing that tool to help make a point, you can also then begin to hide behind that, where you're no longer really responsible for the things you're saying. Well, you know, this is, uh, this is a particular passage, and Rabbi so-and-so said it this way, and then you just sort of build on Rabbi so-and-so's ideas and everything, instead of really speaking with a power and an authority given from God, you're just sort of building some kind of a, 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 an opportunity to preach based entirely on what others have said. Now that, that may not be wrong informationally, but it's entirely lacking inspirationally. Uh, there's, a, there's an authority that God gives those to whom he has called to preach and teach that is demonstrated in the preaching and teaching. Yes, we do quote people because we're, we're blown away by the profoundness of a particular statement, and it helps to further make a point. But ultimately, if all I did every week was come here and simply put a bunch of facts together and then throw a few quotes in to sprinkle it in there and give it some sense of authority, eventually you would walk away thinking, you know, there's really not much there. It's great, but I could do that too. But there's a point at which God says, look, I'm going to speak to these people, and they're going to recognize that you're just not smart enough to have said what you just said. I gave you that. That's where some of this power comes from, from the Lord, and also authority to say it. In Jesus' case, he is the epitome of one who speaks with power and authority. Now, many have abused this idea of authority from a pulpit, even in terms of preaching. Uh, there, there are those that feel that, again, as I kind of alluded to, because they feel as though they have, been a, they have a calling from God, that whatever they say by virtue of them having said it, that's from God. And they sort of get used to this sort of thing. You see them on TV quite a bit, actually. Uh, sad to say. 
but it's true. And not that they have to be on TV to be of the mindset. I mean, you know, anybody can turn into that. So God help me as well not to go down that path. But the idea is that when you just simply speak these things out because it's the thoughts and intentions of your heart, you're not really speaking on God's behalf, and God is not necessarily empowering that. God's word is to be brought forth in God's power so that God may do God's work in the hearts of God's people. And that's something God himself does. That's not anything a preacher can work up. I might be able to get you whooped up emotionally, but that's not the same thing as you being spoken to by the Holy Spirit. Uh, some holy perspiration is not necessarily the same thing as some genuine, authentic, spirit-filled inspiration as you move forward learning from the Word of God and then apply it in your lives. Uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are often present in, in times of preaching and teaching where there's maybe a word of knowledge or prophecy that speaks to somebody in particular in their circumstance and they come up afterwards and they say, how did you know that? Well, the preacher doesn't know that. It's just the Holy Spirit knows that. And he takes something that was taught from the lesson that morning and he applies it to your heart that is particular to you. That's power, but there's also a backing of the Holy Spirit to that kind of preaching. Jesus epitomized this. He's mentioned how he had come with a purpose. His father had sent him into the world, ultimately, yes, to go to the cross, to pay for the sins of the world, to redeem those uh, who ultimately would be saved. But ultimately, on top of that, there was this additional calling of preaching and teaching. Matter of fact, the miracles that he did uh, were done to draw people that they might come, but it was so that he might tell them the truth, that they might be set free, okay? So he is coming to preach and to teach. This is something that is part of his ministry, and he did so as one having authority, not as the scribes Matthew would record in his, uh, in his gospel account. Now, this is one of the reasons why they were astonished, because Jesus would say things, but he wouldn't quote all these other rabbis and everything. He might say, you've heard it said of Moses, but then he'd say something staggering. You've seen it, you've heard it read in Moses, but I say to you, now, think about that. What is Jesus saying simply by saying that? What I'm saying to you is on the same level as the law. You've heard it said, you shall not steal, you shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery. You know, you shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you hate someone in your heart, if you lust after someone in your heart, you've as well as committed the crime that you're not supposed to do legally. Okay, so he's adding his own weight to the very words that were given. That is astounding. They weren't just astonished because he spoke eloquently. This dude has got nerve. This guy is saying something. I didn't mean to call Jesus a dude irreverently, I just meant, but think of what a person would say in that context. This is the law that you're referring to. You're adding to the law. Moses said this, God gave him this on the mountain, and you're adding your two cents with the same weight that the law has. They were astonished, flabbergasted, absolutely stunned that such a thing could take place. But what Jesus said in itself on top of that was also staggering. People would listen to him and say, I've never heard anyone speak like this. People sent to arrest him couldn't even do it because they couldn't imagine. They'd never heard anything so amazing. They were astonished. This was God's word in action, empowered and with authority. He spoke with authority, not just like the scribes. And by the way, you know, Jesus' words had authority because they were Jesus' words. Uh, sometimes we think, well, words have power. No, they don't. Jesus' words had power because they were Jesus' words. The word of God has power because it's God's word. You can't speak to things and let your words have power to change them. They don't. Please don't ever believe that. You know why? Because it will crush your faith when it doesn't happen. When Jesus said, you know, if you say to this mountain, be thou removed and thrown into the sea, Go ahead. Let's see. You have faith like a mustard seed. You can make it happen. Say it. Any one of you, I dare you, say this building, be uprooted and thrown into the sea. Let's see if it happens. Is there power in your words? No. Is, that, is this building or that mountain going to go into the sea if God wants it to? Yes. Only if God wants it to. 
your words contain zero power. Matter of fact, most of the time we try to convince ourselves of things to give ourselves confidence or to get over some kind of a hurdle or to beat some kind of an addiction or some kind of a thing. You know, mantras may build a certain level of emotional confidence, but they don't really have the power to change anything. If God wants to change something, he will change it. When he speaks to something, it is or it isn't. When he calls something to be, it is, no question. When he calls something to not be, it is, no question. When he wants some change in society, he will orchestrate that by his own doing, not because we want it or we say it. There's no power in our words whatsoever. It's all God's word. God's word has power because it's God's word, not our word. So when Jesus speaks these things and their hearts begin to burn within them from time to time hearing these things, and certainly even when, as I'm referring to, just in the, in the road to a mass, did not our hearts burn within us as he spoke to us? This was amazing. He taught with authority, not with the scribes, not like the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, the fact is that not only does Jesus have the authority to say, or does words carry authority, but Jesus has the authority to say the things he says. Okay? He speaks with authority. Why? Because he has authority. He's not borrowing authority. He has authority. He is unique. Having that authority makes him the first and last word on whatever he speaks of. That's an important point for you tonight today. That's not just a historical or theological idea. That has real ramifications. If he has authority, that means he is the first word and he's the last word. Do you hear what I'm saying? That is not just a theory. That means if Jesus says something to you, or you have a view on something, or you have an idea about something, what Jesus has to say about that thing always will overrule what you think or what you say, or I do or I say. Now, whether we obey that or not is a different thing, but that doesn't change the fact that Jesus is the one who is the first and last word on all things. And there are a lot of people nowadays that want to speak on subjects of which they know very little, if anything, or even if they know a lot about it. Jesus has the final word on that. And people do speak about things like the afterlife or spiritual things and stuff like that. And they want to kind of throw their weight on the table and say, here it is, this is what this is all about. You know what, if we don't go to what the Lord has to say about it and trust that and respond to that, we can get ourselves into a heap of trouble. Uh, someone shared with me a link recently about a, you know, one of the latest things that's come around. I won't mention because I don't want to mention who they are, whatever. It's this person that was saying these things. But this 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 idea that God is speaking to us in our dreams. Now, God has spoken in dreams and visions. We see this in Scripture often. God speaks in dreams and visions today. There are many Muslims who have come to Christ because Jesus showed up to them in a vision or a dream, and they have come to Christ. But her thesis was this, that while we're, we need to be careful to make sure we get enough sleep so that God can speak to us in that way, because he wants to, but we're just not listening. And so she puts together, of course, a whole $45 or $50 program that you can buy and order and all this kind of stuff to teach you the secret of how to hear God in your dreams, including an entire dictionary uh, of, 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 of what particular kinds of dreams mean. Okay, now, I'm not doubting her well-intentionedness. I'm not even doubting whether or not she's a believer. But that's crazy. That's not true. That is not biblical. God is not teaching us methods by which we might sleep so that then we can hear him. Most of us don't listen to God enough when we're awake. Okay, that's where the real work needs to happen, okay, while we're awake, you know, it's, but, but that's just it. Jesus is the final word on this kind of thing. Where in Scripture has God ever said, this is the means by which I mean to speak to you? Are there examples you can pull out of context and say, well, he did it here. He must want to always do it this way. That's dangerous. No, that's not true. That's not how you decide what God is going to say. Jesus has the final word on all things. He has authority. Okay? Now, as we see here in our passage, coming back to it here, the first thing that we see this is he's preaching. The, the thing, as he finishes his preaching, what also goes on here is that he begins to, uh, or even in the synagogue while he's teaching, a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon, uh, as if there were clean demons, but an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Do you know, uh, do you, uh, did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God, but Jesus rebuked him and said, be quiet and come out of him. And the demon had thrown it, when the demon had thrown him in their midst, he came out of him, and it did not hurt him. And when they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What a word this is. For with authority and power, by the way, those are those two words. Authority is, uh, is exousia, and power is dunamis. He commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. 
So Jesus demonstrates that he has authority over not just the preaching and the truth of God's word, but he also has authority over the spiritual realm. Okay? Very important. He is not subject to the spiritual realm. He is not subject to principalities and powers. He has authority over them. They are not in partnership. They are not on equal ground. He has authority over them. He commands the demons, and they are silent, and they come out when they are commanded to. Okay, So he has power over the spiritual realm. Now, the people were amazed at this. Of course, we would be. You know, we would, what would you think if somebody, you know, of course, if y'all are believers, I don't believe any of you could be possessed if you're a believer. But if someone walked in here who wasn't a believer and they were possessed of a demon and they started demonstrating this manifestation of massive strength or speaking in some unknown voice or some kind of a thing, and somebody in the room said, come out of him. And he writhed and he fell on the floor and this demon was gone all of a sudden. You'd be a little impressed with that, wouldn't you? I would be, that'd be awesome. I mean, that'd be amazing. You'd be, you'd be astonished at this kind of thing. They were. They were amazed at it. Now, exorcisms took place in that time. The idea that a demon had been cast out in and of itself wasn't the only amazing thing about what happened. Because the, the, the Pharisees, the priests, they had rituals they would go through. And it's not like an exorcism in, in history had never taken place. But again, there was an elaborate... You know, it's, it's a clumsy analogy, but if you ever saw like The Exorcist or something where Father Damien's doing this whole thing, I mean, there's rituals in what he's doing. There's, it's something like that kind of a thing. Practices were put in place to deal with demonic possession with varying degrees of success. Jesus, on the other hand, simply spoke to this demon, called him out, and it was done. No ritual, no holy water, no saying a series of prayers, any of this kind of thing, he simply spoke to this demon personally and told him to get lost. Okay, Now that is something that just utterly staggered them. What kind of a word is this? He commands the demons and they obey him. Wow. Now the people were amazed at this. The religious leaders were not only taken aback when these things would happen in their midst or when they would hear about it, but they were also clearly confused about it. In one instance, when Jesus is casting out demons, and of course they get wind of it, they say he's casting out demons by the prince of demons. And Jesus, of course, deals with that foolishness. He says, well, what kind of a strategy is Satan casting out Satan? That's stupid. Why, why would he do that? You know. At one time, when it comes to his authority in general, they question him and they say, by what authority do you do these things? He says, I'll ask you a question. John the Baptist, was his baptism from above, from God or from men? You know, you know, I always think this, but you know, watch out when Jesus starts asking you questions. There's a zinger coming. You know. Who's who, who is this baptism of? Was it of men or was it of God? And they reasoned among themselves. They said, well, if we say it's from, you know, we can't say it's just from John because the people see him as a prophet, but we can't say it's from God. And so they're stuck. They're stuck. They don't know what to do. They say, well, we don't know. I don't know. He said, well, fine. Then I'm not going to tell you where my authority comes from. I'll make you a deal. You answer my question, I'll answer yours. You can't answer it, fine. I won't answer yours. It wasn't like Jesus was skirting the issue. They were clearly not ready to hear where his authority was coming from. They didn't want to hear where his authority was coming from. They weren't willing to accept John's. They weren't going to accept his. So they're confused. They say, well, what is this whole deal here? You're working under the power of the devil in order to cast out demons. That's ridiculous. What kind of a strategy is that? They didn't understand it, but a lot of people are confused on spiritual things. When God does something amazing in someone's life, what are we quick to do? Oh, there's some other explanation for it. It's like the guy falling off the roof. You know, he's praying, crying out to God as he's about he's, he's working on his roof and he slips, and he's about to fall off. God help me, I'm gonna I'm gonna die. Help me, help save me, and everything. And all of a sudden his belt catches a nail. And he says, Oh, never mind, Lord. The nail got me. We always look for some explanation other than what God is doing. There's always some explanation. Demon possession is just epilepsy. You know, somebody's schizophrenic, oh, it's just there's a medical condition for that. I'm not discounting the fact that there are medical conditions. But these, these demons were speaking to Jesus. We know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. What have you, what are you, why are you here? Are you here to cast us into the deep before the time has come? Why are you here? It's not time yet. This is the way it's supposed to be. Are you going to 
you can't do this yet. Jesus says, get out, go. There's a power to this. There's, there's something different. They're amazed. They're astonished at this. You know the only people that weren't astonished by this? The demons. They weren't surprised at all. When Jesus comes up to them, they're not surprised. They're afraid. Why? Because they know who Jesus is. They clearly understand who he is. We know who you are. We know you can do whatever you want to do. We know you can cast us out. When Jesus casts out the, 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 uh, the here, here's a demoniac, and they, and they cry out, send this into the swine and everything. And of course, you can never resist talking about this case of devil ham. But this this idea that throw us into the swine. And so it's not that Jesus, yeah, fine, okay, go there. They're, they're drowned in the sea. And if you feel bad for the pigs, what are they doing in Jewish country anyway? <laughs> okay, I remember that. So, Jesus has power, and the only people that have no problem understanding it and recognizing it are the demons. And they respond without hesitation. Why? Because they have no lack of... They fully understand that they are absolutely subject to him. They have no room to argue and make a point, fight against him. When he says it, it's done. Why? Because he is the Lord, and he has authority. The demons were not surprised. They tremble because they know that he holds the keys to death and hell. And one day their time is going to be up. And they fear him because they recognize his unquestioned authority over them. They may be disobedient, but they're not stupid. They know him for who he is. And this comes where this I think it was the confusion with the people just simply being amazed. And of course some of them no doubt would come to follow him and believe in him. But it certainly was the cause of the confusion of the Pharisees. They didn't recognize him for who he was. So he has authority over the spiritual realm. Not only that, but he also has authority over the physical realm. Again, we see in verses 38 and 39, and also in verse 40, as people come in to be healed. But he goes to Simon Peter's house, and Peter's mother-in-law is sick. Now, for all of us as Catholics, this should speak to a particular issue. Marriage to the priesthood and all this kind of stuff. But Peter was married, and his wife, uh, her mother, was sick with a, a high fever, Luke says. Dr. Luke recognizes this isn't just, he's just got a cough or something. He's got a high fever. This is a dangerous physical problem she's got going on. And so Jesus goes in and he heals her. He goes by Simon Peter's mother's wife. He just stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. Now, he rebuked the fever. He spoke to it. Okay, now some people in this will see that, you know, maybe this fever was something that was even demonic in origin. There was something spiritual even about it. Much like when Jesus rebukes the wind and the waves, uh, they, you know, it, it could be fairly implied that maybe there was some kind of a spiritual element behind this beyond just the physical aspects of it. But whatever the case, Jesus speaks to the fever, rebukes it, and it goes away. It's gone. It's done. She gets up and she starts serving them. Jesus has power over the physical. He has power over the physical. When you read in Scripture that people who couldn't walk were made to walk, or they couldn't see, and they were made to see, or they couldn't speak, and they were made to speak, or they were dead, and they were brought back to life, those are real things. That's not a situation where someone's just writing some stuff in a story to make it sound exciting. Take all the miracles out of the Gospel, it's still pretty darn exciting. But the miracles that took place are exciting because they really happened. The people respond like you'd expect them to respond. They, uh, they see something working as God does this amazing thing in someone's life. And it's, it's astounding. It's, it's, it's amazing. But what's, what ought to be most amazing about it is the fact that Jesus has that power. He has the authority over the body. Why? Because all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. He is the creator. He is the... When, when, when Paul writes in Colossians that he is the firstborn over all creation, he's not talking about birth order. He's talking about preeminence. He is over all things. All things. And so therefore, he has the power to change them, to fix them, to, to restore them. When the, when the disciples, who also then were given authority to go out on their mission trips and ultimately to go out and carry on the propagating of the good news and to, 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 to preach the gospel, uh, when they would go and they would heal somebody, you know, uh, I have no money for you, but what I have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise and walk. Jesus has the power to change. Of course, it begs the question, do we believe he can today? Or do we think that's just then? 
the people that believed that Jesus could heal were not super saint believers. They were typical people like you and me. A guy at a well didn't even know who Jesus was necessarily. Do you want to be made well? He didn't even answer Jesus directly, yes or no. He said, well, I can't get into the pool. That's where the healing comes from. Well, Jesus heals him. It's not about the pool. It's not about the angel stirring the waters or any of this stuff. It's about Jesus. You don't need to get in there. I'm right here. There's no ritual involved. There's no any of this stuff. There's simply the belief and the understanding that he can. Now, let me flip it over, too, because it says here that he goes on to verse 40, and all of those who were brought to him and came to him, he laid hands on them, and they're all healed. That doesn't mean Jesus heals everybody. There is a sovereignty issue that we need to understand. But don't let God's sovereignty become our out to really believing that he might. Really. Sometimes we don't really pray because we have sort of this nihilistic mindset where we say, God, if it's your will, you can do it, and if you want to, you will. And we just walk away. Other times, we get our faces on the floor, we pray, we bang on the gates of heaven begging for God to do something, and it doesn't happen. You're still right to do that, because he might. You know, it's interesting, you think of Jonathan and his armor bearer, two guys. We don't even know the armor bearer's name, we just know him because he was hanging out with Jonathan. Jonathan saw his son, and he looks over at this area where the Philistines are, and he says, what if God wants us to give us this hill today? What if God wants us to have this? Now, most of us would be there as Jonathan's armor bearer and saying, well, let's pray about it, and we'd pray something like this. Lord, that's an awfully big hill. That's a big bunch of guys. But you're bigger, and if you really want us to do this, then just give us a sign, show us, let us know your will in this. Thank you, amen. In Jesus' name. <coughs> No real fervor, no real desire, no real sense that he might really want to do it. What does Jonathan say? How do we know but that God might want to give this to us? And how do they find out? They march up the hill. Two guys. And they throw out a little thing just so they can know God's will. Hey, you know, if, if we'll call up to them and when, they, and when they answer, if they say, look, you come on down there, we'll come and get you, then we'll know that God doesn't want us to do it. But he says, once you come on up here, then we'll know God's in it. So they get up there and they say, you know, hi, why don't you guys come on up? We'll show you a thing or two. Woo, let's go. They're stoked. That's awesome. That's faith. That's believing that God really will do something. That same God is our God. The one who sends two guys in there to wipe out a, a whole camp of Philistines up a hill. It's, it's impossible. It's the same God who takes 300 guys with Gideon and beats thousands and thousands and thousands. Matter of fact, God made sure to will that army down enough so that they wouldn't take the credit for it. This is crazy. You know, do a study on God's battle plans sometime. They're crazy. That, who, nobody would ever put their stock in this kind of thing. But God does that so that we'll know that he can do that. You know, 175,000 Syrians. One angel God sends. Hey, go take care of that. Wipes them all out. God can do that. He can do that. That's not a, a, just a storybook thing. Your kid's wayward. They've run away. They've gone into a lifestyle you can't stand. Don't give up. God can change that person. Rent's due in a week. You got nothing. Don't give up. Don't start packing. Pray. Ask him. Ask him. What does Jesus say? Ask Keep asking. Please ask. That's what's implied there in the text. It's this, 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 this hunger and thirst to not get off my knees until God says something. Uh, I don't know if I've given this example before. There was a movie called The Apostles. Did you guys ever see that with uh, Robert Duvall? Uh, I mean, the movie's a little out there, but, but there's a scene where he is, he's totally messed up, and he wants to hear from God. He wants to get right. He ends up baptizing himself in the river and all this kind of thing. But there's a scene where he's up in this upper room. He's, I don't know if he's got a friend or somebody. Some, somehow he gets hold of being in an upper room. And he is screaming at God to, to speak to him. And he's, I'm not leaving here. And I, I need to hear you. And then he just sort of stops and puts his ear up. And he just does that over and over again until finally he feels like God gave him an answer. Of course, you'd never build your theology on Robert Duvall and the Apostle. But I love the picture that paints. There was an intensity and a ferocity and a, and a sense of, I'm not getting out of this room until you've said something. 
I'm humbled by that kind of a model, that kind of a picture, and I know people that pray that way. And confessedly, I do not pray that way on any consistent level. I pray. I'm not going to say I don't pray. And I'll, but, but to get on my face and not get off that floor until I know God has spoken, that's something I aspire to. That's something I admire. That is something that humbles me. And incidentally, it's something that I want our prayer meetings to become, genuinely, not just to look spiritual. But uh, this church will be something history-changing if we get on our faces before God and let him have his way. Now, the question I ask after that is, do you believe that? I want to ask you to raise your hand. Some of you will be honest to keep your hand down. The other group will be lying to me. But do we really want God to do that? There's only one way. Um, I don't know that I would necessarily sell my house on this idea, but I think it was Ian Bounds that said, no great move of God has ever happened apart from prayer. I don't know that you could necessarily make that an ironclad case, but it does make a good point. Certainly you could say that no great work of God ought to ever be done without prayer, but God has done things with or without his people. It's a shame when he has to do it without him, though. Let us be those that seek him with intention. But Jesus has authority over the physical realm. He heals disease. He raises the dead with simply a word. He speaks and silences religious pretenders. And he unravels the very mysteries of the wisdom of the Almighty. By the sword that proceeds from his mouth, he will judge the nations and vanquish the devil. Jesus has authority. His words have power because they're his words. He would go on to give this authority to his disciples. And later on in the same gospel in chapters 9 and 10, he'll talk about uh, calling his 12 disciples together, giving them power and authority. And that authority there is exousia. And the power, of course, again, is dunamis over all devils and to cure diseases. Uh, in Luke 10, he would speak about giving them authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. All the power of the enemy? Who's our enemy? The devil. You want to stand up to the devil? I love when preachers do this, by the way. They actually talk about this during the conference this week. Uh, you want to stand up to the devil and shake your fist and tell him, in Jesus, you, know, you get out of there, devil, I'm kicking you in the head and all this kind of thing. That sounds really brave, but it's really stupid. Uh, the devil is smarter than you and I. He's stronger than you and I. He's got power we can't begin to understand. Uh, Michael the archangel stands before him, and if there was ever a being in history, in eternity, that would have some chance of standing up to the devil, it would be Michael. But Michael said, the Lord rebuke you. Don't stick your spiritual chest out at the devil. Jesus said, I'm giving you authority over this. Uh, you know, it's funny. There was a scene in the book of Acts where these seven sons of Sceva, um, apparently Sceva was a priest, and these are his sons, a priest of some sort. Well, they come, and they're trying to cast out demons by the Jesus that Paul preaches. And what do they say? Well, Jesus we know. Paul we know. Who are you? And they beat the daylights out of these guys. Send them off running off butt naked. It's embarrassing. It's humiliating. And it's also what happens when you try to take on the spiritual realm without the authority of God. Jesus gives that authority to his disciples and he says, now go. Use it. Stamp on serpents and scorpions. Go out there and know that you have the ability to stand against all the power of the enemy. You know, it's, it's interesting that when Jesus speaks in, in Matthew 16 about... Um, the gates of hell not being able to stand against his church. That's not to make us, again, stick our spiritual chests out. It's to let us know that he is giving power, not so that when hell comes and gets us, we can still stand. Do gates ever go out to battle? When was the last time you saw an army carry their gates off the front door of the place and start running out to battle with them? No, it implies we're moving in. It implies we're moving forward. It implies we're not sitting here waiting for bad things to happen so we can stand strong. It means we're going out there and being more than conquerors in him who loves us. It means we're, we're going forward, not falling back. But we don't do that without the power of God. But because we've been given the power of God, we ought to do that. We ought to recognize that no stronghold will stand if the power of Jesus comes to bear upon it. If we are walking in his will, that he will do what he wants to do through us. But it's only going to be by his power, not by our own only by his power. It's interesting when Jesus, again, in Matthew 16, gives the, you know, he gives the keys of the kingdom as a word to Peter. Of course, we see sort of the same idea of binding and loosing being told to the rest of the disciples, too. So I think there's really a case to be made for 
Peter being the one guy who had the keys. But it is interesting, and there's a great story. I heard an analogy of this given, kind of imagining yourself there as Jesus gives the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind will be bound. Whatever you loose will be loosed on heaven and on earth. That's power. Here's the keys. And the, ana the analogy that I heard, which, which has always stuck with me, was your own kid driving for the first time. You got the keys in your hand, and you're about to hand them over. Nina will drive one day, and I can understand the idea of having a hand that trembles with keys ringing together. I should have had my keys with me for this one, but as you can imagine, Jesus looking to Peter as he's about to hand him the keys, as it were, thinking, you know, there's a wreck in your future, boy. But I'm going to give these to you anyway. You're not always going to do the right thing. Sometimes you're going to take your eyes off the road. But I'm going to give this to you anyway. When Jesus calls us to follow him and to walk in his will and to walk lives that are lived in the power of the Holy Spirit, he promises power to overcome, knowing that sometimes we will abuse that. Sometimes we will be misguided, we'll fall, we'll make a mistake, we will take our eyes off the road. But he's still given it to us that we might use it for his kingdom. So let's use it. Let's understand that this, this authority is powerful enough to overcome even the enemy's power. But we need to understand that it's his authority and his power, but now that he has called us to walk in it, we should. Matter of fact, he told his disciples, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, therefore, go. Now, one last thing here before we close. Notice here, as we get toward the end here, now when it was day, he departed, verse 42, and went up to a deserted place. And the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach, in the kingdom, uh, preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee. Some of your translations might say Judea. Um, it says when it was day, he departed and went to a deserted place. Now Mark uh, tells us that not only did he go to a deserted place, but he went there and he prayed. And then the multitudes found him and wouldn't let him leave. They wanted him to stay. Imagine, you know, remember, Jesus is tired. He's human. He sleeps. You know, he doesn't have this divine battery that keeps him running 24 hours a day. He sleeps like a person because he's fully God, but he's fully man in the incarnation. And so he was in that condition, in this, this flesh that he had to live in, he slept. And so he gets tired, you know. He, but he oftentimes, as you see through the Gospels, he takes time to come away. Matter of fact, the idea of him starting his day praying is not unique just to this passage in Mark. We see this in his life. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was um, in Luke 6, we'll come to it uh, in a few weeks, where Jesus says he prayed through the night, and then he went and chose his disciples. Okay, It was the habit for him to pray, so much so that at one point they asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. Prayer was essential. What is prayer? Prayer is your communication with God, your fellowship with him in speaking and listening, your, your, your time spent away from everything else so that you can spend time with him with some sense of setting aside all distractions. This is a purposed, intentional time to seek him, but not just for the sake of speaking, but also to hear. You know, when Jesus spoke to his father, granted, yes, there is a relationship there that is unique, but when they said, teach us to pray, when Jesus gives them that model of prayer, you know, we call it the Our Father and all this. That, that's it's not really like a script as much as it's, this is what prayer should include. This is what it should look like. This is the kind of thing that you should feel comfortable coming to your Father, who Jesus called Abba, which is like an Aramaic version of Daddy kind of a thing. You can, you can speak to God that way. And here, don't be afraid to tell him about your needs. Don't be afraid to tell him that you're, you're afraid of falling to temptation, give you the strength to, to not fall to it. Don't be afraid of calling for the kingdom of God to come and for his will to be done here in this place, just like it is in heaven. You can ask God for these things. Jesus made this habit, and then he would go about his day. I would challenge you. Uh, you know, like Psalm 63 says, you know, oh my God, oh God, my God, early will I seek you. Not just earnestly, but early. The idea of it's just, this is my first priority kind of a thing. I would urge you to start your day that way. Yeah, I know sometimes we say, well, I'm not a morning person and it's hard and some of us like to start our day and 
crack at noon or something like that. We like love to burn the midday oil. It's the same Ronald Reagan and that kind of thing. But, but really, there's something to be said about starting your day with prayer, getting up 15 minutes earlier, whatever the case might be, and spending a, a bit of a season with the Lord to start your day. I have found it in the past, you know, there, there have been times when my prayer life was more about apologizing for the day than asking God to guide it at the beginning. And it's always better to start that way. Jesus picks his disciples after such a thing. Here he spends time with the Lord, with his Father, and then he finds himself ready to, to, to work with the multitudes and even then to go on beyond and begin to preach in the surrounding cities and this kind of thing. Our prayer life is essential to our Christian life. It's not a separate thing. It's not just a habit that is occasionally worked on and then left to, to dry up. It's, it's something we ought to pour ourselves into. If we're going to model the kind of lifestyle that Jesus lived, that's part of it. That's actually a beautiful part of it. But having said all that, as we bring this to a close now, again, the passage this morning, well, again, we'll see this, you know, throughout the, the Gospels. Jesus has authority, spiritual realm, over physical illness and this kind of thing. Uh, as we mentioned, and we'll see coming up down the road, at one, you know, who else do you know can speak to nature and it obeys him? He has authority. He has power that we can't begin to think of. Does he have that authority in your life and in mine? Does he have the authority to calm the troubled waves in your heart? Does he have the authority to speak to some sin in your life that you don't want to let go? And you'll respond like you should. Does he have the authority to guide your day? You know, if you have an ambition or a plan in your life, does he have the authority over it to redirect it? Those are questions you have to ask yourself. I mean, it's can't answer that just in that moment. That's that. Those are those are probing kinds of questions. But like the old saying goes, if he's not Lord of all, he's not really Lord at all. He needs to have all of it. He needs to have the authority over our lives. And that's a question I just want to leave there to hang, to set, to make you a little uncomfortable make you fidget in your seat a little bit. You need some good sanctified fidgeting once in a while. It's healthy. It causes us to recognize, I call you Lord, but are you? That's a question I have to ask myself, too. It's easy to say it from here. But my week starts tomorrow, too, just like yours. Is he my Lord? Let's think about that as we close in prayer. Lord, we thank you. I just started by saying, Lord. But you are. We understand this idea. But if the truth is told, then you could shine the flashlight of, you know, of, of, of examination upon our hearts. You might be able to kind of show us things that would make us uncomfortable. It's easy for you to be the Lord here in this place, but it's not so easy once we leave. But Father, you've called us to make us there to make you our Lord. You've called us to surrender and submit to, to set aside our arms and fully give ourselves over to you. That's difficult. That's hard. You know, eat your flesh, drink your blood, or we have no part with you. That's, that's a hard saying, and I understand why many walked away. But it's your call nonetheless. So help us, Father, to count that cost each morning, to take up our cross, to follow you, to die every morning, and to follow you, not to look for an easier way out, but to see it for what it is and to do it. The truth is you do want us to live different kinds of lives. But the additional part of that is that you've not called us to do it by ourselves. You have given us power to overcome sin. You have given us grace to clean us up and set us back on our feet that we might try again when we fall. You have promised to never leave us nor forsake us. But Lord, you have also given us power. You have invited us to storm the gates, to take on a culture, not for the sake of trying to make heaven on earth. That's not going to happen. That's going to be your deal. But to take on principalities and powers, not in our own strength, but in the authority of Jesus. So help us to know your will. Help us to walk in it. Help us to walk forward and never retreat. You know, while it's fresh on my mind, Lord, I would just ask that you would Help us to take on that entire armor of God, that we'd be able to stand 
Father, we love you. And we do thank you that you are gracious. And we ask you to make us into more than we could ever have been, if not for your power. I pray we don't run out of here like some kind of crazy people with our spiritual chest sticking out, but just to go about our lives knowing that, Father, you called us and put us in such a place and time as this, not just to mark time, but to make a difference, to be among those who turn the world upside down. That's only going to happen by the power of your Holy Spirit. So baptize us, Lord. Overcome us. Overwhelm us. Fill us to overflowing. We beg of you. And Lord, if there are any in this room that have never come to Christ, they don't know anything about what it means to walk in power or forgiveness, much less power. And I pray that you'd be speaking to their hearts right now, helping them to realize that they need you, first and foremost, as their Savior and as their Lord as they learn to walk with you. If that's you, and you'd like to give your heart to Christ this morning, then I ask you just to repeat after me this very simple prayer. It's a prayer of confession and asking Jesus to walk with you. Just repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I realize now that I am a sinner and I need to be forgiven. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins because without him, I would have no hope. But you love me and you're willing to forgive me if I will come. And so I do. Please forgive me and give me the strength to walk with you all the days of my life. Free me from the bondage of the old life that I have been living in and help me to walk in the newness of life that you promise. A life of power and a life of freedom and a life that glorifies you. <clears throat> Until I see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Why don't we stand and sing together?
the Lord. You are the God of heaven and earth. Things seen and even unseen, Lord. Things that would, sh would just stagger us and surprise us. But Lord, you're the Lord of all these things. We pray as we've said today, Lord, that you'd empower us and give us the ability to walk out of this place standing in you, standing upon you in your grace and empowered to take on the world that lies outside with the good news. Thank you, Father. We praise you and ask you to go before us in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week. God bless you.